Hi everyone. This is the uh, Magloop antenna that I've been working on for several months. It's uh, not completed yet, but I thought I'd give you a progress report at this point. Uh, you can see it's uh, rectangular, not round, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. The uh, coupling technique that's used which is shown right there gives a very low SWR on all bands. By the way, this covers 10 meters through 40 meters. And uh, let me show you the controller for it. Here's the controller. The top knob is a course adjustment or a band select and the bottom knob is a fine-tune adjustment and uh, with the capacitor design uh, we've been able to spread out the, uh, the high frequency bands instead of having them all piled up close together. Now I'm going to turn the uh, the band selector knob and you can see how fast how fast we can move from one end to the other the motor drive is in the uh, black box there and uh, this PVC pipe here is the drive shaft so you can see how it turns Well, before we dive uh, deeply into the mag loop, uh, let's talk a little bit about antennas in general. Uh, for six meters and higher frequencies, uh, antennas get pretty small. A uh, half-wave dipole is only nine feet long. So it's easy to make uh, self-supporting even uh, that kind of a uh, length can just be stretched across a room. So, uh, it's so easy, I don't see any reason to try and include that in a magnetic loop antenna. Now, on the bands of 10 to 20 meters, now we're talking lengths of 16 to 32 feet, and uh, it turns out to get a fairly low angle, a takeoff angle of radiation, uh, which is optimum for DX, you should be uh, at least a half a wavelength high. So the, these aren't extremely difficult. Obviously they can be made self-supporting because there's a lot of uh, three element Yaggies out there that cover that frequency range. Now when we get into the 30 to 40, 30 meter to 160 meter range, now we're starting to uh, need some real estate. The uh, 160 meter antenna needs to be 246 feet long, and of, of course that's 80 meters. You know, divide any of these by two if you want the height or the half wavelength in meters. So, uh, to, for the optimum takeoff angle, well not optimum, but a decent takeoff angle, a 160 meter antenna would have to be 250 feet high or more. Now I manage, I have a dipole for 160 meters, it's full length, and I managed to work a station in Switzerland and my 160 meter antenna is only about 50 feet high. So antennas will work even when they are not optimum in design. Uh, even uh, QRP people with these very low wattages make contacts. I've worked on uh, you probably have as well. So uh, 
even non-optimum conditions, contacts can be made. And uh, now, now the magnetic loop has an advantage of it, it, its angle, its takeoff angle is a broad range. Uh, and it can be only two or three meters high. So uh, the most popular bands, I believe, are right here. 10 meters to 40 meters. And that's the range that I uh, covered uh, with my magnetic loop design. Now, MFJ has two versions of a magnetic loop antenna. One goes from 10 to 30 meters, and the other one goes from 40 to 15 meters. So they seem to believe the, they, that you want to, in general, cover those bands, uh, but they have not been able to do it with a single design. So uh, let's uh, take uh, another look at the uh, mag loop that I've been working on. The uh, band selector right now is a potentiometer, but in the final design that could be a selector switch where you would just select the band that you want and the other knob would allow the fine-tuning across the band. Uh, this wire is the plus 12 volt power to the uh, whole system and this is the control cable that goes to the antenna. Okay, we uh, just saw the manual controller in action and uh, the control consists of a variable capacitor. This is the frequency control and uh, every magnetic loop that I know of works in the same way. Some are controlled by push buttons and some are controlled by manually turning the capacitor uh, with a knob. So one thing that uh, that I've been able to do is to spread out the frequency by uh, frequency per unit angle by shaping the capacitor plates and uh, the typical butterfly capacitor looks something like that And here's the fixed plates. And once the uh, plates engage, uh, you get the same amount of capacitance per unit angle. And uh, it's possible to change the plate shape so that you get a small capacitive change per angle at first, and then it gets larger as you go to the lower frequencies. Also, there's no reason that every plate has to be the same shape. Uh, one plate could mesh sooner than the other plates to make uh, a finer control. Uh, the controller that we saw in the last video uses absolute position feedback and uh, that means there's a device that's measuring the angle of the capacitor and comparing it to a potentiometer setting. So basically what you have is something similar to the manual capacitor control, but it's remote. It's a potentiometer that makes the capacitor move to where the potentiometer is set. And uh, I think if you look at a lot of videos on mag loops, everybody will tell you how hard it is to set a frequency uh, using the push buttons.
So uh, let's uh, take a look at some more features of the Magloop. This is a uh, very high-Q design. The material is 1 inch by 2 inch aluminum extrusion and uh, it gives a uh, 6 inch perimeter and uh, that's almost the same perimeter as a 2 inch diameter round uh, tubing. But by using uh, rectangular materials we can do a bolded design uh, using angle brackets. Okay, there you saw the uh, close-up of the uh, connections that uh, hold everything together with my magnetic loop. And uh, I'm sure I'll get some flack about uh, connection resistance or contact resistance. So, of course, you want to clean uh, the area where you'll be making contacts. And, uh, but there's another thing going on. Uh, that we'll talk about in a minute. But first, let's look at uh, a skin effect. Uh, on a conductor at radio frequencies, the current flows just on a thin uh, outer layer of the conductor. So, in general, let's say we had a round conductor, the current would just flow on the outside layer of that conductor. So the bigger you make the conductor, the more skin you have, so the resistance will go down per unit length. So in uh, my design I used rectangular uh, aluminum tubing that's one inch on this side and two inches on that side. So that gives us a total perimeter of six inches. And if this were a uh, two inch diameter tube, it would have an area, or a perimeter rather, of I times two inches, which would be 6.28 inches. So you can see uh, the material that I'm using is almost equivalent to a two inch diameter tube. And of course, round things are kind of hard to work with. They're hard to make connections to, etc. And uh, you can see in my design how easy it is uh, to make uh, connections between the pieces. So uh, where we uh, make our connections, we have to worry about connection resistance. Uh, but there's another thing that can help us. Uh, where we use uh, an angle bracket uh, to make a connection, we have a finite area here. And the capacitance of a capacitor is 0.2248 times the dielectric constant times the area in square inches divided by the spacing in inches. And of course this would be a different number for metric units. And uh, the dielectric constant of air is 1 uh, by definition. But when we bolt two surfaces together, this distance between them goes to zero. That means C equals infinity and uh, X sub C equals zero. So that capacitance will swamp out any uh, resistance that's there. There are uh, mag loops out there of various Q or quality factors. Uh, there's high Q ones and uh, low Q ones. So what is Q exactly? Well, the Q of a component, like an inductor or a capacitor, is its reactance divided by its resistance. Now that's an individual component. 
And when we talk about uh, the Q of a resonant circuit, that would be an L and a C, uh, the Q is proportional to the bandwidth divided by the center frequency. So this purple curve here would be a low Q design and the blue dotted curve would be a high Q design. So uh, right away uh, you can see the tuning of a high Q circuit would be uh, very critical in, uh, compared to a low Q circuit. Now another thing that happens with a resonant circuit as the Q goes up, the capacitor voltage goes up drastically. So with a low Q loop, uh, we might have a curve like that versus frequency. A little higher Q would be the dash curve. And a real high Q design would give us a very high capacitor voltage. So there's some considerations here. The, the higher Q would be a higher efficiency, but harder to tune. And the higher the Q, the higher the voltage. Uh, th there's some uh, fairly low Q uh, mag loops available that use coax as the loop. And uh, they also use uh, receiver type capacitors that are uh, use plates that are very close together so they can't stand very much voltage. And uh, one of those manufacturers has a hockey puck looking device that gets mounted near the uh, capacitor where the electric field is high and they, they call it a power intensifier I believe. Uh, to, to keep the capacitor voltage down and uh, whatever it is, it lowers the Q. So the uh, efficiency goes down even more. Uh, I believe it's probably a lossy capacitor, but uh, whatever. So there's trade-offs between high Q and low Q. So uh, my, my goal is to have just the right cue uh, so that we can uh, do some interesting stuff. So let me show you something uh, that I believe will revolutionize the, the way uh, mag loops are tuned. Uh, most of them today are tuned by transmitting and then adjusting uh, the SWR, uh, which is really a messy way to do it. So uh, let's take a look at a, uh, what I think is a better way to do it. Yeah, I think one of the uh, best things about this design is the tuning method. Uh, we've actually, because it's a very high Q LC circuit, uh, we can turn it into an oscillator and this switch uh, allows that capability and then with the fine tune knob you can actually hear the uh, frequency that you're on. So you would just zero beat the uh, signal that you would want to tune to and uh, you would be on the uh, on their frequency. I can show you the the high Q uh, it's kind of hard to get the right angle here but down here my hand does almost nothing and it turns out the closer you get to the capacitor the more sensitive it is so the uh, 
loops that you see people doing uh, manual tuning of the capacitor, they must be awfully low Q or you wouldn't be able to, uh, to do it. Because you can see how sensitive a high Q design is. Well, that's about it for now. I have a lot of work to do yet. And uh, I plan to make some more videos to help keep you informed. So be sure and subscribe if you don't want to miss those.